feel like the first time I gave a sermon, everybody was just staring at me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, my, my name is Father Spiro. I am the uh, Bruce Domino of St. Sophia Cathedral in Miami. I am also the Vicar of South Florida. So on behalf of His Eminence, Metropolitan Alexios, uh, we welcome you today and we thank you for, for being here for this incredible day that the Lord has given us for this oratorical festival. For 20-something years now, uh, I've been here in South Florida and watching some of the most important and most wonderful speeches that I've heard. Why so important? It is because it's coming from you, our teenagers, our Goyans. Um, in Scripture, of course, it says, Lord, open my lips and my mouth should declare your praise. And I see nothing better and stronger than to hear that from each and every one of you. I want to thank you, first of all, foremost, for being here. I want to thank your parents especially for encouraging you, your advisors for encouraging you, and for bringing you here. It's not a small trip for some of us, but it is an important trip. And I so look forward to hearing each and every one of you present today. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord our God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here in Fort Pierce. We ask that you be with each and every one of the contestants as they bring forth and open their lips to declare your praise, that they may do so with the greatness that has been given through you. Give them the peace that comes from you. Allow them to speak eloquently. Allow them to come forward and declare their faith, that it may enlighten and edify all those who hear. We ask that it is not through luck, so we are not giving good luck, but through your grace and your love that they participate. Again, we thank you for the parents and the advisors, and we ask that you be with each and every one of them as they continue during this day and bring them home safely in the afternoon. We ask this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I turn it over to Nick. Thank you, Father. And uh, on behalf of, of, of Father John and the Parish Council, I want to welcome everybody to, to St. Nicholas. We're very excited to host the 2022 District Oratorical Festival. We've had a, a great turnout this year, and uh, we're, we're very happy to have you all in our church. Um, we passed out a program to everybody except for the speakers and the judges, so hopefully you have a copy of it. And you'll see in the program that uh, we have a list of all the speakers in the junior division and all the speakers in the senior division. We unfortunately had two, two arrivals today that we didn't know were coming. So, so there's one extra speaker in, in the junior division and one extra speaker in the senior division. The reason we don't give this program to the judges is because from this point forward until the end of the ceremony, everything is anonymous. So none of the speakers will be introducing themselves by name. Everybody was assigned randomly a speaker number before the, the, the competition began. So we'll only be referencing everybody by, by speaker number. Once the competition has concluded, we'll ask everybody except for the judges to dismiss themselves and to go back into the hall. There's a, a lunch prepared for everybody and the judges will stay here and deliberate. And then when they're done, we will retire into the hall as well and uh, we'll have a, a brief award ceremony. Um, so the three judges here, I want to thank them for, for their participation and, and welcome them. And also we have a timekeeper here. Father John is going to be our timekeeper. So all the judges, he's in row one, two, three, four, five. Um, they're they're on, on our right and his left, and he will be holding up the sign to notify you guys when the time is running low. So I think um, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. I'm going to, we're going to begin with the junior division.
So we're going to begin with the junior division. We have eight total speakers, and I'll call you up by speaker number, and then I will also read uh, your topic. If I'm incorrect on the topic with the light entries, please raise your hand and, and let me know so I make sure that I get it right for the judges. So uh, speakers, does anybody have any, any questions before we begin? Um, one last thing, we got a new microphone system uh, just for today. And uh, if there's any potential issues with, with sound, I've instructed the speakers that they may stop, we'll correct it, and then the speakers can, can begin their speech again. And the judges, I ask you, don't penalize um, for, for any kind of, of sound issues. We'll just, we'll just start over. Okay. okay, so let's begin. We'll start with speaker number one in the junior division. And the topic is, share what you have learned about yourself after a technology fast of at least 21 days. What can we learn about our relationship to God and the world by fasting? Reverend fathers, honorable judges, fellow speakers, family and friends, good morning. Why fast? Fasting is a spiritual discipline that the Bible instructs. Fasting is an act Jesus expects his followers to do, and he teaches that God rewards fasting. According to the Bible, fasting is defined as purposely reducing or eliminating food consumption for a certain period and purpose. Less food consumption is not the only way to display a direct devotion to God. More modernly, a technology fast can prove just as devoted to God as regular fasting. When you give up eating, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They make their faces look sad to show people they are giving up eating. I tell you the truth. Those hypocrites already have their full reward. So when you give up eating, comb your hair and wash your face. Then people will not know that you are giving up eating, but your father, whom you cannot see, will see you. Your father sees what is done in secret, and he will reward you. Matthew 6, 16-18 when praying for a certain action to happen in your favor, fasting displays the depth of your desire. Fasting demonstrates that you are committed to your prayer request enough to pay a personal sacrifice for it. God values sincere desire and faith-filled prayer. Fasting is always associated with prayer in the Bible, no matter the method. While they were worshiping the Lord in fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they have fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Acts 13, 2-3 The importance of fasting. Fasting was a common among God people in the Bible, especially before a significant achievement, miracle, or response to prayer. It prepared them for a blessing. Moses fasted before he received the Ten Commandments. Moses was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Exodus thirty four twenty eight. The, the Israelites fasted before a miraculous victory. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. 2 Chronicles 20, 2-3. My journey. The first day of my technology fast was a complete failure. I was devastated, but I wondered aloud if my friends could ever live without technology. All of them replied with a simple no. I felt a glimmer of optimism, and I realized I wasn't alone. I tried again the next day, but failed once more. On the third day, I persisted in Eventually, and I was eventually ready to begin. What I learned from fasting. God's grace empowered us to service. God wants us to be so full of his grace that we can say with Paul, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. God's grace is not acquired by works, but it does result in work done in his service. Fasting shows God how we can thank him for all the blessings he has bestowed upon us. Grace, which is God's life, enters us and works in and through us, allowing us to be and do anything in his service. Through fasting, God reassured me, you are never on your own. Even though you feel like you are the only one in the room, God is always with you, forever protecting you. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you. So there's going to be a brief uh, pause in between the speakers while the judges tally up their scores, and then when, when they've completed, they'll give me the nod and we'll bring up the next speaker. And judges, for your reference, that was topic number one. Okay, thank you. So next will be speaker number two, and uh, the topic for speaker number two is topic number three, and it is choose a saint whose life has been important to you or your family. Discuss what you find most inspiring about this saint and what others can learn from how they lived your life. <clears throat> Good morning, priests judges, and parishioners. The topic I chose was topic number three. The saint I will be discussing is Saint Nicholas, the patron saint of our church. Although, when most people think of Saint Nicholas, they think of the man who climbs through your chimney and gives you presents on Christmas, but that is far from the case. Nicholas was born in the ancient Lycian seaport city of Patara. When he was young, he traveled to Palestine in Egypt. He became Bishop of Myra, a small town in Turkey, after returning to Lycia. By the time Nicholas died, he was known around the world for his good deeds. Nicholas is known for many things. He even received a feast day, which is celebrated on the day he died, December 6th. He is the patron saint of sailors, merchants, archers, repentant thieves, children, brewers, pawnbrokers, and students. He became the patron saint of sailors after he was caught in a storm while on a ship. He used his prayer to calm the storm, and the story was spread throughout England. He was also very well known for his generosity. In one story, he saved three girls from a life of slavery by delivering gold for their dowries needed by their father. In another story, Nicholas resurrected three boys who were killed by a butcher and put in a tub of brine. Stories also tell of Nicholas helping those who were wrongfully accused. Even after his death, he helped people in need. After he died, pirates came to Myra to steal treasures from the church of St. Nicholas. They also took a young boy to be a slave to their ruler. 
The boy served as the ruler's cupbearer for one year until St. Nicholas appeared to the boy and blessed him and showed him the way back to his home. These stories and more helped Nicholas to be known across the world. He became known as a bringer of gifts and miracles. The reason St. Nicholas is important to me is because my grandfather, father, and me all have Nicholas in our names. We can learn many things from the way that St. Nicholas lived his life. He dedicated his life to God at an early age, even using his entire inheritance to help the hungry, sick, and needy. Nicholas was known for helping those in need, which all of us should do. He did not give to people for fame or for praise, but to show how generous God was to him. He did not... Oh, also, like all saints, he stood up for the truth of God, even when he was persecuted, put in jail, and tortured for his faith. He had not renounced his faith, but strengthened it. Even after he was imprisoned, he continued to preach the word of God. The traits that St. Nicholas shared are traits that we should all have and act upon. So next time you think about Santa Claus, think about the man who inspired it all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker number three will also be talking on, on topic number three. Choose a saint whose life has been important to you or your family. Discuss what you find most inspiring about this saint and what others can learn from how they live their life. Testing, testing. Reverend fathers, honorable judges, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow speakers, good afternoon. Have you ever encountered a life-threatening experience? Well, I have. At the age of two, while visiting a monastery in Greece, 
a pious monk gifted me and my family an icon of St. Arsenios of Cappadocia, a saint of our church since 1986. On our return flight, we stored it in the overhead compartment. A passenger gave me a piece of candy. Before you knew it, I was unable to breathe. Frantically, my mother tried everything, even calling out to our Lord Jesus Christ. A male voice from behind offered a hand. Soon after, I took a breath. My parents waited to thank this person, but he was nowhere in sight. Years later, God enlightened us while venerating the icon. It was the clothing in the icon that matched the clothing of the stranger. Through St. Arsenios, God lent a hand and saved my life. St. Arsenios was born in 1840 and raised in Farasa of Cappadocia. At an early age, he too had a life-threatening experience. While traveling with his brother, St. Arsenios was caught in a turret. His brother cried out to St. George. Suddenly, he appeared, recalling how a horse-like monk picked him up and took him out of danger. From then on, he wanted to become a monk. St. Arsenios courageously educated people about the teachings of our church, often in secrecy, jeopardizing his life. This is a proclamation of true orthodoxy. We also may share the power of prayer, faith, and hope with others. Everyone, even the non-Orthodox population, considered St. Arsenios the only doctor in the area. Through God's grace, he was able to heal souls and bodies by reading the gospel and reciting psalms over them. Can we do the same? Yes, by accessing the Go Arch Daily Reading app. St. Arsenios lived a humble life. He refused services commenting, our faith is not for sale. This encourages us to do good for others without expecting anything in return. When praised, he replied, So you think I am a saint? I am only a sinner worse than you. Don't you see that I even lose my temper? Christ does the miracles you see. I do no more than lift my hands and pray to him. St. Arsenios baptized all children without discrimination. At one baptism, he gave a child his own name. When questioned, he replied, Shouldn't I name someone after me to fill my shoes one day? This child later became his spiritual son, St. Paisios of Mount Athos, who wrote his biography entitled St. Arsenios the Cappadocian. Let us focus on the final words of my patron saint and remember that it is faith and prayer that feed our souls and make miracles happen. The soul, the soul, take care of it far more than the flesh which will be eaten by worms. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Speaker number four is also uh, talking on topic number three. Choose a saint whose life has been important to you or your family. Discuss what you find most inspiring about this saint and what others can learn from how they lived your life. Testing, testing. Can you all hear me okay? Reverend fathers, honorable judges, parishioners, and fellow speakers, Kalimera and good morning. When I was five years old, I watched as my father was baptized in my beloved Greek Orthodox Church. He was given the name of patron Saint Pantaleimon, meaning all merciful. It is a moment I will never forget. Now, eight years later, being able to stand before all of you today and share the special memory and the life of our great Saint Pantaleimon is a blessing to me. As we all know, there is a brutal war raging. Many people are wondering, how can I help? You can pray to Saint Pantaleimon. He was venerated in the Orthodox Church as a mighty saint and protector of soldiers. His first name, Pantaleon, means a lion and everything. In 1151 AD, Orthodox Prince Isislav painted the saint on his helmet for battle, and through his faith and actions, he was saved from death on the battlefield. Saint Pantaleimon saved people in the past, and he can save us now. Saint Pantaleimon was a physician who used his blessings from God and his personal wealth to heal the sick without anything in return. He distributed his inheritance to the needy and did it with care and generosity. What is most inspiring about Saint Pantaleimon is that he could have lived an extravagant life, rich and carefree, but instead chose a life of humility and devoted himself as a servant of God to people in need. In Philippians 2, 3 for 4, it says, But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. The, the, oh, the defining moment of St. Pantaleamon's life was when he was walking down the street and saw a boy who had died from a snake. He prayed to Jesus to heal the boy and destroy the snake, and if his prayers were granted, he would become a devoted follower of God. A miracle occurred and the boy rose. And at that very moment, St. Pantaleimon decided to change his life and walk in the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. The emperor at that time caught wind of the saint and wanted to test him. He brought out a paralyzed man and after his pagan priest failed to heal the sick man, St. Pantaleimon prayed to God to heal the man and he was healed. The emperor was furious tortured Saint Pantaleimon, scraping him with iron hooks, boiling him with tar, and throwing him into the sea chained up. Throughout his torture, he praised God, persevered, and denounced the emperor. In this moment, he embodied one of the most powerful verses in the Bible, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There are many things we can learn from Saint Pantaleimon's life today. His life teaches us that your spiritual wealth holds greater value than your material wealth. The definition of generosity is not giving back money, it is being kind. Really making an impact is going to our communities and trying to help others without anything in return. Be inspired by Saint Pantaleamon's life and lead by faith. Do not be afraid. Saint Pantaleamon invites us to paint his image on our spiritual shield as we wage our own battles and our journey through this life. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, speaker number five will be talking on topic number four. Discuss how you would share your Orthodox Christian faith with a visitor to your parish. Is my voice clear? Reverend fathers, honorable judges, parishioners, fellow speakers, good morning. How would I share our Orthodox faith with a visitor? Well, in Matthew 22, 1 to 14, in the parable of the wedding feast, Jesus tells us, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. Well, I go to school with people who don't go to church, but frankly, that offers the best opportunity for me to share our faith. That's why I brought my friend Logan to church. As the car pulled into the parking lot, there were a few questions visibly turning over in his mind. Why am I here? How did I get myself into this? As the anticipation grew as we stepped through the double doors, the entrance was dim, lit with the soft and warm glow of candlelight that casts a gradient from its center and draws you in. The mysterious smell of incense was visible on his face as the sensations instantly overwhelmed him. The quick dart of his eyes from one place to another wrote paragraphs of thought as he stepped into an unfamiliar world. Why are there troughs of sand and candles? Who are these people in these paintings? Why are they singing? Why is he chanting? What is he saying? What is that smell? Eventually, the questions dwindled and fell silent in his mind as he simply absorbed the atmosphere. From my experience, atmosphere is an essential element of our weekly religious experience. The icons, intricate stained glass windows, sounds and smells all contribute to a grand, holy, and calming setting for worship. But also grand is the history of orthodoxy and its liturgy. The Eastern Orthodox Church is the only pre-denominational church, and our liturgy, by son, written by St. John Chrysostom, is, dates back to five centuries old. But what is a church but people? People like St. John, but also people like you and me, members of a community, a family under God. Of all those defining features of our faith and our parish, if I were to share one thing with an outsider, it would be our community. That's why I invited my friend, Logan, to a Goya meeting. There, we discussed plans, talked, laughed, played games, and through acknowledging, accepting, and bonding with a stranger for a few minutes, my fellow Goyans invited someone into our family. Sharing our faith like this is something that we don't do enough, yet need to. Leviticus 19 expounds upon this concept. Quote, The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native-born. Love them as yourself. The hospitality shown to Logan by my fellow Goyans fulfills that commandment of Leviticus, along with countless other areas of the Bible that compel us to immerse others with our faith. So now, I compel you to immerse others with our faith. We must explain the history of Jesus and the saints. We must share the hymn of our choir. We must indulge strangers in the words and celebration of Christ. Ephesians chapter 19, 2 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ as the center cornerstone. 
In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. As the Goya meeting ended and we turned to leave, my friend Logan looked into my eyes and thanked me. Thank you. Speaker number six, topic number three. Choose a saint whose life has been important to you or your family. Discuss what you find most inspiring about this saint and what others can learn from how they live their life. Testing. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Reverend fathers, honorable judges, fellow parishioners, Good afternoon. As Orthodox Christians, we know we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves, to turn the other cheek, and to have the humility to consider ourselves the worst of sinners. However, we also know that this is easier said than done. This is one reason it is so important to study the lives of the saints of the church, who are evidence that we too can express humility and love that Christ demands of us, when faced with different and odd people. Saint Innocent did just this thing, and in that he do and in doing so converted an entire people to Christianity. Saint Innocent was sent to Alaska by the Russian Orthodox Church to spread the gospel to those who lived there. When he arrived, he encountered a tribe of savages known as Aleuts. Aleuts practice shamanism and believed they interacted with the spirit world by going into trances. St. Innocent didn't judge or criticize them for their religious beliefs. He didn't resort to force or violence to convert the Aleuts. Instead, he showed them love by learning their language, their culture, and their routines. He endured obstacles just to live among them as one of them. He treated them as equals with respect kindness, and most importantly, brotherly love. He evangelized with few words and let his actions persuade the Aleuts to follow Christ. It's hard for all of us, no matter how much we love God, to dampen our instincts to judge others or to seek revenge when we've been wronged. But in these moments, we must be aware that those thoughts are planted in our hearts and minds by Satan himself. He tries to take advantage of our weaknesses to drown us in the whirlpool of sin and wrong. But with the strength of God, we can resist these temptations. In John 15, 12 through 13, Jesus states, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one more than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
We must strive to acquire the humility to look at someone of different race or culture or someone we disagree with or someone who has hurt us and not think or act negatively against them, but to instead treat them as a brother. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter tells us, Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Can we show brotherly love to each other even amongst today's strife? Of course we can. God is always with us. He knows we have that golden love in us. And anything with God is possible. Now I ask all of you, do you show your brotherly love to others? We must all, as brothers and sisters in Christ, strive to become a saint innocent today. We should use St. Innocent as an example of what we must do to show brotherly love to everyone. So let us start now. We were created in the image of God. Now is the time to attest to our humanity, to show mercy, kindness, compassion, and love. In Hebrews, we are instructed to let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. As Christians, we must hold brotherly love as a treasure in our hearts for us and others. As we continue to walk toward Christ, let us continue to remind ourselves of the important gift of brotherly love. Thank you. Okay, speaker number seven, topic number three. Choose a saint whose life has been important to you or your family. Discuss what you find most inspiring about this saint and what others can learn from how they live their life. Good morning, reverend fathers, honorable judges, and fellow parishioners. I wrote about a great saint who inspires me and my family. His name is St. John the Baptist. St. John inspires us in many ways. He was courageous, brave, and honorable. He made a choice to have bold faith and teach repentance. King Herod feared losing his throne, so he commanded all infant boys up to the age of two to be killed. God was merciful and spared John. Zachariah, his father, was killed upon the altar of the Lord's temple because he would not tell them where he was hiding with his mother. Elizabeth, his mother, died 40 days later, and St. John relied on the angels in the desert to raise him. He had to be brave. It was a rough life. Reading about this has inspired me to live with, to be brave and to be, to be, to be brave and to trust God like John did as a child. He lived on much less than I do, and I should try harder to live on less, to trust God to provide. It takes a faith equal to what John had to do this. St. John always pointed the way towards Christ's coming. 
Even in the Old Testament, prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 40, verse 3, I hear the voice of someone shouting, Make a highway for the Lord for the wilderness. Scripture was fulfilled with John's message of repentance and preparing for Christ's coming. St. John baptized Christ, the Lamb of God who takes upon himself the sins of the world. This is where he got the name, the Baptist. He was made worthy of placing his hand on the one whom he prophesied. We can repent, be baptized, and be cleansed of our sins. This prepares us to accept the Savior of the world. John made a way of preaching repentance and behaving honorably. He boldly told Herod he was immoral, and he was beheaded as a result of this. This example demonstrates the need to be bolder in my witness to others and to stand up for what I know is holy and right, to try to live a moral life like St. John. As the Gospel of Matthew tells us, Truly I tell you, among those born of a woman, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. As great as he was, he always made a point to let others know how much greater Christ was than he. He inspires me to live a bless, to be bold, honorable, and to be repentant, because the kingdom of God is at hand. Several times a year, our holy Orthodox Church commemorates this wonderful saint. I am glad to have this opportunity to think about his life and message, and remember what a good example he is for all of us. Thank you. Okay, our final speaker in the junior division, speaker number eight, will be speaking on topic number four. Discuss how you would share your Orthodox Christian faith with a visitor to your parish. Testing. Reverend fathers, honorable judges, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My senses were filled with wonder as I entered our church and took my very first step into the altar, the most sacred part of the church. As a seven-year-old, I was instantly overwhelmed by the ornate furnishings and the beauty of the icons. The incense 
with its strong odor and smoke was overpowering. And as a young altar boy, I felt intimidated by all these surroundings, including the priest in his colorful vestments, leading us in prayer and administering the sacraments. I recall nervously carrying the cross in procession around the church. What did all these vibrant, colorful rituals mean? As time passed, I matured in my faith. I can now appreciate how I experience God through all the sights and sounds as I support our priest and hold firmly to the traditions of our holy church. There's an inexplicable peace and calmness that envelops me as I serve the Lord in our Orthodox community. Today, I feel a closer connection to God. I know this is where I belong. So, how do I convey my personal holy experience to visitors of my parish? I share that I feel I'm in God's presence and comforted when I enter the Greek Orthodox Church. During each service, if we are willing and open, we can engage our soul and whole heart through our senses. We use our vision to see the iconography, which teaches us a lesson and a story in every image. We use our sense of smell to smell the smoke from the incense rising up to heaven with our prayers. We use our sense of hearing to hear the beautiful hymns from the choir, almost like angels singing in heaven. We use our sense of taste when we receive the Holy Communion, opening our body to fill ourselves with God's Spirit. And we use our sense of touch when we make the sign of the cross, as we call our Lord being nailed by his hands and feet. These are just a few ways that we, as Orthodox Christians, use our senses to open the door to a closer, more intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Theotokos, and to the many saints who came before us. I would let a visitor know that the church is a place where I pray into unison with my brothers and sisters in Christ. In Mark 12, verse 30, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I would tell them, we feel God's love as we recite the Nicene Creed. It describes what it truly means to be an Orthodox Christian. We also feel a connection with God and others as we recite the Lord's Prayer. As we gain a more deeper understanding of our faith, we come to realize that there are many aspects in our denomination that we can share with new visitors to our parish, such as how using our five senses connects one with God, and when we take the time to understand the biblical stories through the icons and reciting of prayers. I can understand how someone new to our parish can find this very overwhelming, but with certainty, there is more than meets the eye. Being an Orthodox Christian is not something to take lightly, such as a hobby or something that's fun. It's a huge part of our daily lives. As Orthodox Christians, we are firmly implanted within the church from the day of our baptism to the day we are called to be with God in heaven. Finally, I would say it's a privilege to share my Orthodox faith and tradi traditions in the hope that others may also experience God as I have. Thank you.
As the judges finish up, I just wanted to say congratulations to each of the eight, eight of you. Uh, job well done. All those speeches were very impressive. Okay, so you guys can relax for a little bit, and uh, we'll start the senior portion of our program in just a second. Okay, so we'll begin with speaker number one, who will be talking on topic number one, discuss the significance of orthodox iconography and how icons enhance our worship. Can everyone hear me? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Reverend fathers, honorable judges, fellow speakers, brothers and sisters in Christ, Calimera, good morning. Look through your looking glass. What do you see? I was four, but still remember that day like it was today. As we arrived at the hospital, I took a deep breath and was led to the center of a glass partition. Standing on my tippy toes, I scanned the room, pressing my forehead on the window. I saw her. I saw her for the first time. What an icon of perfection. At that moment, a feeling of peace overtook my whole being. I saw my baby sister for the first time and fell in love. That angelic image reminded me of the peace and serenity I feel when surrounded by the icons I see every Sunday at church. This same feeling of awe came over me a few years later when my papu was working on the dome of the church. He had set up scaffolding all the way to the top to plaster the dome and prepare it for the iconographer. My papu helped my sister and me climb carefully to the top. What a feeling! I felt like I had reached the heavens touching the angels, icons around us everywhere. My head was twirling with excitement and my heart skipped a beat. St. John of Damascus wrote, the icon is a song of triumph, a revelation, an enduring monument to the victory of the saints. At that moment, I felt that triumph and revelation. Icon is icona or agiografia. It comes from ayo, meaning holy, and grafo, meaning to write. Icons are not drawings or creations of imagination. They are writings of the heavens. An icon is a work of art made using natural elements from earth. The iconographer paints through a very prayerful and spiritual process, drawing us near to God's presence here on earth. Icons have been described as windows to heaven. We pray through them. Quote, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. End quote. John 14, 6. When we enter the church, we light a candle, make the sign of the cross, and venerate the icons. The beauty of hundreds of icons on the walls, ceilings, priest vestments, the bishop's throne, and even on the floor, overtake our spirit. The iconostasion, or wall of icons, separates the altar from the main body of the church. It is divided by central double doors, known as the royal doors or holy doors. To the right of the holy doors, we find the icon of Christ. To the left, the icon of Panigia, the mother of God. This reminds us that God came down to earth as one of us. For the Christian Orthodox, this shows the way heaven and earth are united by Christ. Icons have been part of the Orthodox Church since the early days of Christianity. At that time, icons were used to show gospel events to Christians who were not able to read. It was only a small period of time that icons were not present in the church. Between 730 and 843, 
iconoclast or icon destroyers, officially prohibited the worship and display in fear of idolatry or worship of idols. The iconoclast period ended with the death of Emperor Theophilus in 842, where after his death, his widow, Empress Theodora, restored icon veneration in the Orthodox Church, an event we still celebrate as the Feast of Orthodoxy on the first Sunday of Lent. Every year, all the children, priests, and elders of our church process with their icons, holding them up proudly. It is absolutely impossible to imagine any liturgical rite in the Orthodox Church without icons. As the Orthodox writer Philip Serard has said, prayer and icons are united. Icons are like a looking glass, a gateway to heaven. Look through your looking glass and fall in love. I did. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Speaker number two um, will be talking on topic number five. In every church service, we pray for peace in the world, usually many times, yet war and violence persist. What is the Orthodox Christian approach to war and violence? Reverend fathers, honorable judges, fellow parishioners, good morning. Every day, there is something new happening across the globe. Daily, we turn on the news to watch and listen to the horrific events occurring right in front of us. We become oblivious to the violence and hate we bring to each other. And it's dispiriting to know that brutality and war will continue to happen. As Orthodox Christians, we contain a positive perception of peace. Peace in the world doesn't mean the disappearance of all warfare and strife. It is the state of well-being and the relationship between God and man. Orthodox Christians approaches the aspect of war as the opposite of peace and as a manifestation of sin. In essence, peace is the goal of Christian life. In the Orthodox Church, we acknowledge the importance of remaining at peace with our brothers and sisters, the world, and with our Savior Jesus Christ which is why during every church service, we pray for peace of the whole world. The actions we bring about each other stands in the way of that. The most commonly occurring actions today preventing world peace are violence, war, corruption, discrimination, terrorism, and many more. These acts are viewed by Orthodox Christians as alienations from God and against his will. Organized practices of wide-scale killing is the worst manifestation of sin and is seen as the most vile thing someone can commit. Orthodox Christians view taking of one's life as killing your own brothers and sisters in Christ. The church knows that in today's world, there may be no perfect and peaceful way to keep peace for everyone. That is why it recognizes the devastating necessity of using force to protect from the threat of violence. As this is in fact still a sin, force without spite or extremities can be forgiven through prayer. Orthodox Christians during divine services also pray for those in civil authority 
and that they may govern in peace. Some may ask, why do we pray for the armed forces, military, and for those who are in command? Well, the purpose of the government is to protect the lives and welfare of those who shelter under its protection. The church respects that they cannot dictate the way the government is ran, so they pray they take appropriate measures to avoid violence and to constitute peace throughout. As the church is completely against the use of violence, there are principles created that are intended to excuse and forgive those who don't intend harm. Orthodox Christians interpret war as unjust by nature, but it can serve a just cause. You could say the people of Orthodox faith have mixed feelings toward the concept of war and peace. Throughout history, war has either been to resolve conflicts, support and fight for a just cause, or to gain power over another. But as horrible as warfare is, there are some positives. The outcomes of the battles fought years before our time shape the world we live in today. The established laws put into place, the rights we are granted, and the life and liberty we have were all fought for. So being said, war and peace has a deeper connection than you initially thought. Orthodox Christians have a deeper sense of the relationship between war and peace. We not only recognize that in some cases it may be a necessary evil to protect the innocent and good from those who want to deprive us from peace-loving life, but that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is indeed our peace. The beginning of Genesis tells us about the true creation of God's eternal word. Harmony, peace, communion, and abundance are the holy things God set out for mankind since the beginning of time. Gideon once said, the Lord is peace. And in Psalms 133.1, it quotes, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. The true Orthodox Christian way of achieving peace is living, living in harmony with thy brothers and sisters and to remain in good standing with Jesus Christ. Through following a holy path and living by God's word, you can achieve a spiritual form of peace and even when aggression and hate still proceeds, remember what it means to be at peace. Thank you. Okay, speaker number three, topic number one. Discuss the significance of Orthodox iconography and how icons enhance our worship.
Fellow speakers, reverend fathers, and honorable judges, good morning. When discussing iconography, which is the visual representation of images and symbols used in a work of art or study of said image, there are many definitions. Iconography studies the classification, the description, and analysis of the content of images, the subjects depicted, the particular compositions and details used to do so, and other elements that are distinct from artistic style. The word iconography comes from the Greek image in a form to write or to draw. Without it, we would miss the significance of certain symbols and their meanings, which extends into the next point of religious icons. A secondary meaning, which is based on a non-standard translation of the Greek and Russian equivalent terms, is the production or the study of the religious images called icons, which is used in the Byzantine and Orthodox Christian tradition. This usage, which may consider simply incorrect, is mostly found in the works translated from languages such as Greek or Russian, with the correct term being icon painting. St. John of Damascus, a theologian, defended the use of the icons in Christian worship. In his dissertation on the divine images, he writes, if we have made an image of the invisible God, we would certainly be in error, but we do not do anything of that kind. In fact, we do not err. We make the image of God incarnate who appeared on earth in the flesh, who in his ineffable goodness lived with men and assumed the nature, the volume, and the color of the flesh. To the return to the arts of sacred images after a long and difficult struggle meant the return to old practices. The images of Christ and all of the saints are now officially proclaimed by the victorious church as having divine powers and their contemplation as necessary for our salvation. Charged by this new religious function, all paintings with a religious subject placed in the shade of all other art representations. In art history, an iconography may also mean a particular depiction of a subject in terms of the content of the image, such as the number of figures used, their placing and gestures within the icon. The term is also used in many academic fields other than art history. For example, semitonics, media studies, and in general usage. For the contents of the images, there is a typical depiction in images of a subject and related senses. Sometimes, distinctions have been made between iconology and iconography. Although the definitions and so the distinction has been made varies. When referring to movies, genres are immediately recognizable by their iconography, their modes that become associated with a specific genre through repetition. The symbols and motifs that has helped us make an identification correlating to symbolism are a prominent cross, Christ on the cross, and other figures that surround the cross. These are all elements that we relate to in our modern day society. By standardizing the symbols and attributes of a subject, like the crucifixion of Christ, helps viewers identify important figures and events. Consider that in many places throughout time, most people couldn't read, and images played a very important role to help allow diverse audiences learn stories. By increasing the audience, the symbol's impact on the audience will also increase. An aid is that of Christian imagery. Images and artwork specifically intended to help in the act of worshiping God by creating a focus for wandering eyes, a reminder to wandering minds, and a visual depiction of people, places, and events to reassure us that these people really lived and these things really happened. As iconography continues to be a staple part of our art history, we identify icons that enhance our worship in our current daily lives. By learning more about the history of icons, we can continue to grow and thrive as a community. Thank you.
Okay, speaker number four, topic number five. In every church service, we pray for peace in the world, usually many times, yet war and violence persist. What is the Orthodox Christian approach to war and violence? Can everyone hear me? It's very clear. Okay. Reverend fathers, fellow parishioners, and speakers, and fellow judges, good morning. There are 40 wars that are actively occurring in three, con three dozen countries from the Middle East, Northwest Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to a major drug war going on in Mexico. In a world with so much commotion and unrest, how are we as Orthodox Christians meant to deal with it all? What is the part we come to take amongst all this violence? And what is the right way to respond to it? As Orthodox Christians, it is our role to support the side which best encompasses the ideals of forgiveness and reconciliation as well as those who, in the eyes of history and God, will push forth peace for our society. I vividly remember, when I was young, right before bed, my mother would have my sisters and I recite the Lord's Prayer. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. There was one part of this prayer that puzzled me, and it goes, and forgive us our trespasses, and and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Why was it that I should forgive them for doing wrong to me? Why shouldn't I keep my anger in this situation? This phrase is really what gives away the core of Christian Orthodox teachings. Forgiveness. And it did take a while for me to understand. The purpose is not to forget the situation altogether, but rather to keep my own peace. There's no need to justify my anger and violence. In forgiving, I will be able to go on with my own life. Christ admonished Peter by saying, put away your sword, for they who live by the sword will perish by the sword. Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. When it comes to confronting violence, it is not our job to punish our offenders. Rather, it is important for us to hold our own and not fall into temptation of seeking barbarity or brutality. Such, such actions are not only sin, but break one's spirituality. Think of those who live through wars. Many go in as strong soldiers with hope for a better world and come back emotionally and spiritually confused, broken beyond repair. Taking a life is something that is to be left to God. It is not something we, as the people of God, are meant to take on ourselves. Now, it is necessary to know that society is not as peaceful as we wish it to be. For many years, the church has had to live along with wars and struggles. This brings up the question of, if, as Christians, we can't fight these battles as well, we do have those who serve in the military and as policemen, but they do so to maintain the peace. This is quite difficult because to maintain peace in many instances, there's no other option but to take part in war. For this reason, when it comes to supporting wars, we have to look at them as a means to an end. The means is the war itself. The end is to create a more lasting and far-reaching peace. We acknowledge su such circumstances in the anaphora of St. Basil the Great. The priest prayer says, be mindful of all authorities and of our armed forces. Grant them a secure and lasting peace that we, in tranquility, may lead a calm and peaceful life, 
in all reverence and godliness. While we don't wish for them to take part in the sin of violence, there is an understanding of those moments of necessity, needing to maintain peace for the rest of God's people. It's meant to be done for a greater pursuit, a sacrifice. While a difficult challenge to solve, as Orthodox Christians, we must approach war and violence by turning to the teachings of God. The Christian Orthodox approach to war and violence is to fall back on the teachings of God. This means finding the path that best allows for peace and forgiveness, even in times of chaos and violence. Because as many of us are aware, in wars, there's no winner. There's merely those who survive. It's our hope that those who have survived are able to bring tranquility, that they are fighting and manage to end the vindictive motives of enabling violence. Thank you. Okay, our final speech today, speaker number five, topic number three. The Orthodox faith, faithful pray to the saints for physical healing, and we have examples of saints like Cosmas and Damien who were doctors. What does this teach us about the Orthodox perspective on faith, health, and medicine? Hello. Oops, it fell. Hello. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, Fellow Speakers, Brothers and Sisters in Christ, Kalispera, good afternoon. When Maya Ya was a toddler, she was on her deathbed. Burning fever, sore throat, stomach pains, and too weak to get out of bed. The doctor was inaccessible because of a very bad snowstorm. Her mother didn't know what to do. As the evening hours passed, she thought she would lose her little girl. She kneeled beside her bed and placed her head softly on her, tears streaming down her face, falling on her child. As she, pr she started praying to Ayo Nectario for any miracle to save her daughter. She anointed her child with his oil and prayed all night. She fell asleep, still on her knees. At the break of day, Maya opened her eyes. The fever had miraculously subsided. Her mother leaned over, kissed her forehead, and was overcome with joy and gratitude as she thanked St. Nectarios for the miracle he gifted her, the life of her little girl. James 4, 13 to 15 reads, Is there anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. 
Is any among you sick? Let him be anointed with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick man. We are body and soul, his creatures, and it is to him that we turn in moments of illness. We not only pray for the healing of sickness, but the church has offered the healing of God through the sacrament of anointing. The Holy Unction service goes back to the early days of Christianity. Orthodox liturgical scholar Father Kalievas stated, in ancient Christian literature, one may find testimonies of the mystery of unction in St. Irenaeus and later in Saints Basil the Great and John Chrysostom, who have left prayers for the healing of the infirm. Some of the most revered saints in the Orthodox Christian tradition combined faith in God and the exercise of a healing ministry. The evangelist Luke was a physician. His gospel and books of the Acts of the Apostles have a large number of medical terms and references. Saints such as Cosmas and Damien, the two brother physicians, and Saint Pataleimon are examples of widely venerated saint physicians of the Orthodox Church. The life of Jesus Christ was dedicated to a healing ministry. The four Gospels repeatedly record Christ's concern with the physical well-being of people. Many sought out Jesus to be healed of illnesses. Quote, large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. End quote. Luke 5, 15. Believing in the healing power of God does not mean that human efforts at healing are ignored. Medical treatment is seen as a human cooperation with God's healing purposes. In fact, Orthodox teaching recognizes a place for human effort. The use of healing, medicines, even surgical operations have been understood throughout history in the church to be ways of cooperating with God in the healing of human illnesses. When Maya Ya turned 16, she visited the island of Aegina, where St. Nectarios was interred. On arriving at the monastery, she was immediately aware of the serenity of the place, as hundreds of people venerated his relics. The chapel and the simple beauty of his tomb took her breath away. A sweet fragrance filled the room. One of the nuns approached her, placed a small bottle of oil in her hand, and whispered, we know why you came. Do you believe in miracles? Amen. Thank you. All right, terrific job, everybody. That concludes the speeches for today. Excellent work. Um, if you guys, if everybody wants to head over to the social hall, there's some lunch prepared. The, the judges will finish up their deliberations, and then um, we'll go over and, and let everybody know the results. Thank you.